I know what you're thinking. Oh god, another 5950X and 3080 video. And I don't blame you, because this video will mostly be the same as most other build videos. However, there will be some differences here, but we'll get to that. Now, I did want to make videos about the RTX 3000 series graphics cards and Ryzen 5000 series CPUs earlier than when I'm posting this video, but as a small YouTuber, I don't have the luxury of being handed a shiny new graphics card or CPU to talk about for when the embargo lifts. Though, let's be honest, that kind of treatment would be nice. But I'm like 99.9% .9 of you guys where I had to keep searching, refreshing, and hoping I was fast enough to get any of the new RTX 3000 series graphics cards and Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. And after a few months of suffering, specifically with the graphics card, I was finally able to complete my build. And let me just say, this is a huge upgrade compared to my previous computer I had when I first started making YouTube videos. By the way, if you guys want to know how I got both the CPU and GPU, I'll leave a link in the video description to a Discord server that'll ping you when any of the RTX 3000 series and RX 6000 series graphics cards, as well as Ryzen 5000 series CPUs are in stock. You'll be able to tell the server what part in particular you're looking for, so you don't get pinged for everything there. Now, I'll be blabbing a bit in terms of what parts I got, so if you don't care about that, I'll leave timestamps somewhere on the screen, as well as chapters. Also, I'm calling this the Why Not PC, and you'll find out soon enough why. Okay, now as regular viewers know, my previous case was a Thermaltake Core P3, which rocked an i7-8700K, an RTX 2080 Founders Edition, 32 gigs of RAM, and a SATA-based SSD. Now, all that stuff would still be fine if I didn't start making YouTube videos, but here I am, and now I need something much more powerful so I can use my time efficiently. My previous system would always stutter on playback when I had the slightest amount of effects or editing, versus now, where everything is buttery smooth, so I'm not frustrated and wasting time anymore. So not only is this an upgrade for gaming, but a massive upgrade for when it comes to editing videos, which for what I do now on a day-to-day -day basis, which is some gaming and mostly editing YouTube videos, is basically an investment and a tax deductible. Now, as always, with any new subject I make a video on, I would love to hear whatever feedback you have for future videos similar to this, because this isn't going to be my last build video, far from it. So if you guys have anything to say, let me know down in the comments. Okay, let's start with the case, because one issue I had with the Thermaltake Core P3 was how big and heavy it was when everything was inside of it. Because I travel with my computer a lot, I decided on an ITX build. And let me tell you, if you're like me who struggled for literally months planning and trying to figure out which ITX case has the best bang for buck or has great thermals, I know your pain. My brain almost exploded with the amount of ITX cases I was looking at. But thanks to Optimum Tech having all sorts of amazing data for ITX builds, his video made this process a lot easier. In the beginning, I wanted to get the Encase M1, but then I saw the price tag of $210 plus shipping and I was immediately turned off. The next best case in terms of price to performance and even design was the Cooler Master Masterbox NR200 with its perforated mesh side panel, which had great thermal performance and a much more reasonable price of $80. But then I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to be getting an RTX 3080 and a 5950X, I might as well go all out and get the end case anyways, just to say that I have one. So I did. Side note, I've never really built or even seen an ITX case up close, so when I got this, I was laughing at how comedically small it is. I knew it was small, I just didn't know it was this small. Anyway, most of the components such as the RAM, motherboard, and all that stuff was pretty easy to choose. For the motherboard, I got the ASUS ROG Strix X570i ITX motherboard simply because there aren't many X570i ITX options and it was the coolest looking one. It has great overclocking potential, which I may do in the future, has Wi-Fi 6, and most importantly, has two NVMe slots, one of which has support for PCI Express 4.0. Speaking of, as I started buying parts, Samsung had just released their 980 Pro NVMe SSD, which has insane read and write speeds of 7 and 5 gigabytes per second. Do I need speeds that fast? Maybe, maybe not. All I know is that if I get this now, I'll be happy for a long time. So I got the one terabyte 980 Pro and a two terabyte inland Gen 3 NVMe SSD for storage like my games, since modern games really like taking up 200 gigabytes of space nowadays. Call of Duty. Oh, sorry, something was stuck in my throat. For the RAM, I got 64 gigabytes of G-Skills rip jaws since I don't need RGB because I won't be able to see it. It has a cast latency of 18 and has memory speeds of four gigahertz, but as of right now, my motherboard only lets me run it at 3.8 gigahertz, and I'm not sure why. 
I'll investigate it to see if I can fix that sometime in the future, but for now I'm not too worried about a 200 megahertz loss. Now some may be asking, well why 64 gigabytes? 32 seems a lot more reasonable. And to that I say, yeah, you're right. But I'm not reasonable, and 32 gigabytes just doesn't sound as cool as 64. Also, I use Adobe products to edit, and Adobe products love using RAM. And there were times in my previous system where it was using 32 gigabytes of RAM, so I thought, why not? For the power supply, there was really only one option that would support the requirements of this system, and that was a Corsair SF750 watt small form factor power supply. It's fully modular, it's 80 plus platinum, has individually sleeved flexible cables, and has the small form factor price premium costing $185. Next, we have the shining stars of the video, the RTX 3080 and the Ryzen 9 5950X. The RTX 3080 has been a real struggle to get. After missing out on release day, I joined a Discord server which notifies you via a ping when an item you're looking for is in stock. After about a month, I was able to snag an MSI RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio. The only issue with that is that it was too big to fit into my case. Turns out that the NCASE M1 only supports two different RTX 3080 graphics cards, the ASUS Tough Gaming 3080 and the RTX 3080 Founders Edition. Now you might be wondering, well then, what did I do with the Gaming X Trio? Well, I sold it $400 more than what I paid. Sue me. Next, I went back to the Discord server I mentioned earlier and searched for a 3080 that could fit into my PC. Now here's the thing. A big issue with using something like this Discord server is that when you get a ping that something is available, so do tens of thousands of other people that are in that server. And when you have that many people flooding a website within one minute, not including other servers that offer a service like this, which is free by the way, let's just say that we kept crashing Newegg and Asus's poor excuse of a website since that could barely handle 100 people at once. At least, that's what it felt like. Anyway, after a few weeks of failing to get an Asus Tough OC or Founders Edition 3080, I decided to go on Facebook Marketplace, purchase the Asus Tough for $1,000 from a local, and slid that puppy right into my PC. And at this point, my happiness has nearly peaked. All we're missing now is a CPU. Speaking of, long story short, I purchased the 3950X for the time being, so I could finally use my new PC to edit until I got the 5950X. I missed out on release day, had my make me a bot rather than using the Discord server I've been using, and turns out that bot was about one to two minutes faster than the discord server. I got a ping from my bot, purchased the 5950X, and after one full minute of placing my order, the other server got a ping. This isn't just a one-off thing either, this was all the time, so basically I suffered much less getting the Ryzen CPU compared to the RTX graphics card. Now with all that out of the way, let's show you some benchmarks. Now there aren't going to be that many games I'll be testing here because every other reviewer already did reviews out the hoo-ha on things like Red Dead, GTA 5, F1, Tomb Raider, and so on. So what I'll be focusing on is some competitive titles, some titles I've never seen people benchmark, as well as max quality graphics compared to competitive graphics. And by competitive, I mean basically it's just the lowest, since not only does it give you a lot more FPS, at least usually, but also makes it a lot easier to see enemies since a lot of shadows, foliage, and so on are either disabled or minimalized. I'll also be keeping a lot of the typical applications open in the background, such as Discord, Chrome, Steam, some peripheral software, and so on, to show you what performance you'll actually be getting in-game, since I'm pretty sure that's what most people have in the background anyways. I'll also be comparing this to the 3950X I've been using to give you an idea of what to expect with these titles and graphics settings. Starting with Rainbow Six Siege at 1440p, there really isn't much of a difference when we look at the 3950X and the 5950X at maxed graphics. Only about a 30 FPS difference. It's when we set the graphics to the lowest setting, mine is keeping the LOD quality at the highest, so objects that are farther away are clear, when we start to see a big difference going from 263 FPS with the 3950X to 352 FPS with the 5950X. When going to 1080p, we see even bigger differences. With the graphics setting set to the highest, the 3950X had an average frame rate of 228 FPS, and the 5950X had an average FPS of 261. Now that isn't that big of a difference, and most people won't notice that, but moving down to the lowest graphics settings is where we start to see some insane performance increases. Going from an average frame rate of 267 FPS with the 3950X to 410 FPS with the 5950X. This is an insane increase, and is where we start to see the 5950X show off its muscles in gaming. Now, when I tested Escape from Tarkov, things got a bit weird with the 3950X. With the 1440p max setting, the 3950X got 80 FPS, 
and with the low setting, it got 91 FPS. The weird part though is when I dropped down to 1080p. At 1080p with max graphics, the 3950X got 73 FPS, where dropping it to low got at 84 FPS. For some reason, this performed worse than 1440p, where that got 80 and 91 FPS with their max and low graphics settings. Now I changed the resolution mid-game, noticed the worst performance, and thought that the game just didn't like me changing the resolution while in a match. So I restarted the match, and the same thing happened. I then restarted the game, and it kept giving me similar results. A bit odd I think, but the game is terribly optimized anyway, so whatever. Anyway, going from the 3950X to the 5950X is when we start to see some noticeable increases in performance. Not as much on 1440p though, as with the max graphics settings, it only gets 83 FPS. Only 3 more than the 3950X. The same thing happens with the low graphics settings, where it only gets 95 FPS, which is only 4 more than the 3950X. Most of the increase is in 1080p, which at the highest graphics settings gets 90 FPS, and with the lowest gets 110 FPS. So bigger improvements compared to the 3950X at 1080p, and unlike the 3950X, it beats 1440p as it should. Next is Star Citizen. For this test, I spawned in New Babbage, ran to the tram, and stopped benchmarking once I got to the elevator to the ship retrieval station. I would have done more, but the elevators weren't working. I also didn't see the need to lower the graphics quality, simply because this game is the type of game that should be admired with the max graphics quality. Anyway, at 1440p with the 3950X, that got an average of 40 FPS, whereas the 5950X got 49 FPS. At 1080p, there wasn't really much of a difference. The 3950X got 44 FPS, and the 5950X got 50 FPS. So switching CPUs did help the performance a bit, but if you can play at 1440p, play at 1440p and not 1080p. Then lastly, we have Valorant. For this test, I did Deathmatch, which connects you to 11 players rather than 9. So performance might not be as good as regular unranked or ranked matches, but it shouldn't be too much different. Just like Siege, we see big increases. At 1440p with max settings, the 3950X only averaged 184 FPS, whereas with the 5950X, that averaged 352 FPS. Going to the low graphics settings, we actually see a slight dip in performance, getting only 177 FPS with the 3950X and 342 FPS with the 5950X. At 1080p, things didn't really change, with the 3950X getting 182 FPS with the max settings, which is a 2 FPS decrease compared to 1440p with the same settings. Now the 5950X did do much better, getting 324 FPS, but it still did worse than it did at 1440p, where that got 352 FPS. With 1080p low, things increased slightly compared to the max settings, getting 193 FPS with the 3950X and 351 FPS with the 5950X. So awesome improvements, but changing your resolution and graphic settings in Valorant doesn't really help much with something as fast as an RTX 3080 because it seems like we're CPU bottlenecked. So that's it for gaming, but what about thermals? Now being that I pretty much copied Optimum Tech's part list for the NKSM1 build, minus the graphics card since he used an RTX 3090 and I'm not balling like that, I was expecting to get similar thermals to him, but that didn't happen. On his 3950X and RTX 3090 tough build, his CPU sustained 70 degrees Celsius when doing a 30 minute blender run, which hammers the CPU. My build on the other hand got 55 degrees on idle, which is good, 60 to 65 degrees when using my PC for general use, which is still good, but isn't so great when it comes to heavy loads such as rendering videos or resource hungry games, as I get 86 degrees Celsius with the side panel on and 81 degrees with the side panel off. Now this isn't dire. Sure, the CPU might not last as long as it would if it ran at 70 degrees Celsius, but since I'm a reviewer, I'll be using this until the next best CPU comes along and replace this with that, so I won't have to worry too much about it dying prematurely if I had the CPU for, say, three or more years. Now, the GPU, on the other hand, does great. It idles at 48 degrees Celsius and doesn't get any hotter than 66 degrees Celsius when set to performance mode via the switch on the actual board. And that's basically it. Overall, I'm extremely happy with this build, though seeing how my girlfriend's 3070 and 5600X runs extremely cool, even under heavy loads, I'm thinking I should have gotten the NR200 instead to save some money and possibly have better thermals. Now sure, her parts require way less power than mine, especially the CPU, but for how cool it runs, I think this would have a much better time in there. Also because the graphics card is so tall, the 8-pin cables get smushed up against the side panel, and the side panel can never really stay on after about a few minutes. 
I ordered some 180 degree adapters, but I'm not sure if it'll be here when I'm recording the B-roll for the video. With that said, I've already traveled with this PC and it's very easy to carry around because it's extremely cute and small, just like my dick. As a side note, I would have tested more games, but since I'm already a few months late to the party on the GPU side, and a few weeks late to the CPU side, I'm sure most people already got all the information they need from the dozens of other tech YouTubers on day one. I just felt like there was no need to bore you with the same stuff you've been seeing from all the other channels, so that's why I did it a little different here. Also, if you guys are interested in seeing how the 3070 and 5600X performs, let me know down in the comments below. Give me some more unusual games that I should test and what I should do to add or change to make these videos better. But other than that, thanks for watching and I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like. If not, you can leave a dislike. If you want to check out any of the stuff I featured in this video, if they're even in stock, check the links in the video description. And as always, have a great day every day. Peace.